Okay guys, good morning. Hope you're well, 24th of September, so uh, looking forward to the session ahead. Just want to uh, cover off a few things in the briefing this morning. I mean, look back at yesterday, um, so the first session of the week, of course, but uh, really only, uh, I'd say, two main points of note, with one of them being the most important, which was some, you know, quite, again, disappointing data from Europe. Um, so we'll look back at those manufacturing and services, PMIs, and have a have a look at um, the market reaction to that. And I want to talk further about how that might play out with regards to things like Germany's fiscal policy and, you know, as the data indicates more and more that Germany are probably in a, a technical recession. Is this going to finally um, force the hand of the German government to kind of just open the checkbook a little bit and spend some of the surplus that they've got to try and boost economic activity. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, we'll obviously cover off all the, the headlines that have been hitting the wires overnight. We've had this US, uh, sorry, UN General Assembly, so there's been some Brexit chat from, from Boris, of course, and then we'll have a little look at uh, good old Donald Trump's uh, latest impeachment saga and whether or not that's got any ability to escalate and uh, you know cause any market um, volatility. I mean, certainly at the moment, financial markets aren't too bothered by this latest Trump revelation. But we'll discuss this. But let's um, let's look back at yesterday first before we talk about what happened uh, last night. I'm going to bring up the uh, euro dollar chart here, and we'll start. This is a good place to to begin um, when discussing yesterday's session. Um, um, kind of in the briefing yesterday, this was kind of happening in, in real time, and I did cover it a little bit. So we had a nice solid uh, devaluation of the euro, and uh, key breaks of that Friday low, which was kind of coinciding with the low when you go back to the kind of 16th and 17th of September. So nice euro devaluation, uh, moving down to test um, some levels um, that we had seen earlier on in the month, but. Um, let me just get that back into picture. Um, so a good, um, well, looking at this, it was really f just shy of the 111 handle where we started the, the session and, and in the end bottoming out down at 110.32. So, you know, definitely a decent move, 60, 70 pips to the downside. So what was going on here? Well, as I mentioned, bad news from Europe. And let's um, take a look at that. So if we switch up the screenshot here and just take a look at some of these... Um, services and, and manufacturing PMI figures from yesterday. I'm going to start with Germany here. So let me just bring up the chart of the manufacturing PMI. So we covered this live in the briefing uh, yesterday morning. Uh, but as you can see, we had a print on the far right of this chart, 41.4, which basically is the worst reading for 10 years. So you've got to go back to right in the height of that global financial crisis a decade ago to find the last time that um, the German manufacturing PMI number was this bad. Now, we had expected um, a move back above, to, uh, back up to 44, which, you know, even if it was 44, is still very bleak, and a very long way below 50, so into contractionary territory for this PMI reading, of course. So 44 would have been uh, a continuation of the really bad figures that we've seen over the last six, seven months. But to dip again is very worrisome. If I go to a 10-year chart, you'll see what I mean. This move to 41.4. Uh, takes us definitely firmly below that 2012 low. And so, yep, uh, it's a 10-year low. Um, in the crisis, we did get down to 32, um, but certainly 32 is a, a number uh, you, well, you won't see very often. I mean, such was the extreme nature of that global crisis. But um, so this was obviously bad news. Um, on the services side, if we look at uh, Germany's services sector, but of course they are very, certainly for a developed economy, Germany are unusually dependent on their uh, manufacturing sector. Um, but on the services side, it was really disappointing as well. I mean, I guess the silver lining is at least this number's above 50. So you you would say that the um, the services sector is still in expansionary territory. But nevertheless, it was quite a bit worse than what we were expecting. Um, we also had some disappointing figures from France. And if we look at the, uh, let's take a look at the Eurozone GDP, uh, not GDP, PMI numbers overall, because we had Germany and France only uh, reporting yesterday. 
um, as well as then the European overall number. And because of the German disappointment and obviously because of the um, huge portion um, of the European data that Germany makes up given the size of that economy, um, it's not a surprise that this dropped to a new 10-year low as well. If we go back 10 years, oh, sorry, this wasn't a 10-year low, apologies. Um, we're edging towards 45. We were a touch below this back in 2012 um, at the height of the Eurozone debt crisis. Um, but you get the picture here, right? It's, it's continued bad news from, from Europe indicating that um, we could well see the likes of Germany when we get, because look, we're at the end of quarter three here, so we're going to get German GDP data um, not for a few weeks. We need the quarter to end. So actually, the first readings of quarter three GDP won't really so come until the end of October. Um, but as you can see on this chart, quarter two was negative. So this is German GDP here. So quarter two minus 0.1%. We did have a minus print last year, but um, you'll probably understand that an official technical recession has to be two quarters in a row of negative GDP print. So look, we're really worried that... Germany are in recession and if Germany are in recession well then you know that's the that's the the core engine of the European economy um, I'll flip back to the charts to talk about how this impacted on some other assets obviously the euro devalued but in the end it did rebound um, a good half of that sell-off and we've caught some key resistance um, at these lines that we'd drawn up so the, the Friday low and then the low uh, the sort of double bottom back end of last week, so the 16th and 17th of January lows, um, sort of coinciding with Friday's low, and it was that um, technical area that provided the stubborn resistance throughout yesterday afternoon, and we remain below that price point um, today. So Euro weakness, as you'd expect. Um, if you take a look at the DAX, it's not, a, it's not a dissimilar sort of pattern here. So German equities um, taking the biggest move to the downside. Um, let me just move a couple of these lines. So we had this low. I drew a box on this when the German DAX was selling off off the back of the data in the briefing yesterday. And I drew this box picking out the low from 17th of September. And we'd broken below the Wednesday, Thursday double bottom at 12,333. And that was the obvious target. We did actually slip through there um, before then kind of going through a bit of a messy consolidation. That Wednesday, Thursday low provided some good resistance um, late morning. Um, but in the end, actually, as we drifted into the back end of the European session, we did see the DAX then move back up above that level. And indeed, overnight, we've gapped and traded up and opened right back up at the, the low points that we saw from Friday, actually. So the DAX almost reclaimed the whole move. And you might scratch your heads a little bit over that. I mean, why would the DAX recover so much of the move when actually it was the German data specifically that was the most surprisingly bad? So here's one sort of um, potential reason. Um, let me take you back to the chart here. And I want to talk about German fiscal policy, um, a, a topic I know all of you uh, love close to your hearts, uh, German fiscal policy. <clears throat> Let me show you something. Uh, if we look at the government here, and I want to look at the um, government uh, budget. And what you see here on your screens, <clears throat> excuse me, is German budgets in surplus. And this has been the case for the last few years. You can see five years in a row, and not only five years in a row of surplus, the surplus has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually 2018 printing at 1.7%. So this means that the this is looking at how much does the German government earn? So what are the tax receipts coming in relative to how much does the German government spend? Okay. And the difference between the earning and the spending, this is your um, you, you know, you're either gonna have a budget deficit or a budget surplus. Most uh, sort of developed, certainly Western economies are running with deficits that's where they're spending a little bit more than they're earning and this is the concept of borrowing today to then invest in the country's future growth okay um, but germany have definitely been taking a, a different path and you could really say they haven't had a deficit since back in the crisis and even right at the worst point of the crisis their deficit was only minus 4.2 percent you know compare that to the likes of the us the us almost hit minus 10 percent in the crisis Compare that to the 
the casualties of the crisis, like Greece, their deficit was more like minus 16%. Um, but my point is, right, Europe is struggling. Economically, Europe is very weak. Who's the biggest economy in Europe? Well, it's Germany. Um, and Germany are sat on this big fat surplus and are not spending it. They're not delivering any fiscal stimulus to try and uh, stimulate economic activity in their own country. And if they did do that, then actually it would be a, a really quite powerful stimulus for the whole of Europe. And if Europe gets an economic boost, then, you know, it's a powerful stimulus for the world, actually. So Mario Draghi's been kind of very frustrated, particularly with German fiscal policy over the last few years. He did a, another parting shot yesterday in his final testimony before he uh, steps down and, and gives up the position of ECB president to, to Lagarde. And yesterday, again, he was quite vocal about trying to urge um, particularly Germany to just loosen the purse strings and start stimulating. And they've definitely got some money. I mean, there's a lot of politics in this. Why have they been, why, why have they got such a big surplus? I mean, it's, it's quite natural um, sort of German fiscal policy in the last few decades to be incredibly prudent. I mean, this is, Merkel is written all over this chart. This is, this is, this is Merkel style. You know, it's about being fiscally, fiscally disciplined and prudent. Um, but the time for prudence is over. Germany's most likely in a recession, and the government need to do something about it. So we'll see. Um, as we go through quarter four, you know, as we get that GDP print for quarter three, which will be at the end of October, will we start to hear noises out of the German government that we're going to see some kind of stimulus package? Is this a reason why the DAX actually, in the end, almost retraced the full sell-off yesterday? Um, so I think certainly something to look out for in the weeks to come. Uh, any German fiscal policy noises coming out of Frankfurt or Berlin, then uh, this could well have quite a powerful effect on European markets what, you know, across the continent. Okay? It's something we've been waiting for. Uh, so I just want to put that on your radar. Um, and I need to talk about the Bund here. And I'm going to bring them and make this chart much bigger. And these are this is German 10-year bonds. And... I want to bring this onto a, a weekly chart to put things into perspective. Um, this, this market, let me just mark up these kind of big major technical levels like the 2018 low, for example, down at 156.87. You've, um, you've got the October low from that year, not too far away from that. Um, but certainly on the upside, um, we had caught some key resistance in quarter one. 166.83, and then we had a powerful move to the upside, okay? Um, now, the ECB have just rolled out another rate cut. They've just rolled out uh, um, a restarting of their um, QE program, um, albeit only at 20 billion a month, but it is open-ended. Um, so this means buying more buns. And so... That might drive the price to the upside, of course. That, but I mean, it's disappointing the amount that they've decided to um, restart QE with. And you've seen this big correction back lower here for buns. But generally speaking, buns are right up at the top end. I mean, if I go to a monthly chart, you'll see that um, once that loads, you'll see that German bonds are right up at the very top end of their um, all-time ever highs. Let's just put it that way. Once we've broken that 2016 top, at 168.95, this thing's just ramped aggressively higher. All-time ever, ever, ever highs. Um, German 10-year yields into negative territory. You know, the remarkable scenario that Germany can borrow money for 10 years and get paid for it. Um, it is a, uh, a sign of our very unique times, this chart. But is this the top? Um, you know, have German buns is this kind of multi-decade rally, is it over? And, and here's the thing to think about. If, German, if the German government do roll out a fiscal stimulus package, and they might not, but if they do, well, then that's bullish, right? So you should expect German equities to benefit from that. You should expect safe haven markets to be negatively impacted. So you might see Bund's um, moving lower off the back of a German fiscal stimulus package. If they go ahead with a big package, well, then they're going to need to borrow more money, which means issuing more buns. So you might see the supply of buns increasing. The supply goes up, 
well, the price goes down as well. So that's a negative for German prices. And then if this fiscal stimulus package actually works um, and generates some growth, well, then we should expect some upside inflation. And if inflationary pressures move higher, then you know, you're going to find the likes of the ECB not needing their QE program anymore. And if inflation's higher, yields move higher, which means prices move lower. Um, so there's some good arguments to suggest that if the German government roll out a fiscal stimulus package, you may well see um, a bit of a pivotal turning point for uh, this bond market. And maybe we'll see things trending to the downside into year end. And will we get back to that top from 2016, which would be the first key kind of price point from a technical perspective. So I wanted to just put that German situation onto your radars, you know, picking up from that bad data from yesterday and what does it mean and, and what might that bring out of the German government in the weeks and months ahead. So um, that's yesterday. The other thing from yesterday, just to make sure we cover off the two important uh, moments. Um, the other one was involving crude oil um, where we had the Saudis uh, coming out and, and let me just draw a box around the candle that I'm referring to. We had a, a sharpish sell off around about half past 10, breaking the Friday low and then moving down and actually briefly moving below Wednesday's low from last week. But as you can see, it's recovered and we're kind of back chopping up around about where we were before the news. So the news was just that the Saudis think they'll be back fully online, fully operational, production back to where it was pre drone strikes by the end of next week. Um, so that's the news there. Uh, right, let's have a look at the headlines. Um, what's been going on? And here's a look at the Bloomberg home screen. You've got Boris, who's um, sort of uh, featuring quite prominently, and that's because he's been uh, talking Brexit, obviously, at this UN. Uh, General Assembly, he met with Merkel, he met with Macron, he met with Tusk. Not a very little um, news flow out of that meeting other than Tusk tweeting, no breakthrough, but no breakdown, time is short. Uh, so that's pretty much all we got. So just suggesting that they met, they chatted, they didn't make much progress, but you know, at least it didn't um, you know, at least the meeting didn't break up in acrimony, um, but obviously just re-emphasizing the fact that time is definitely running out. Um, one thing that um, Boris is going to do today, so it's quite a pivotal day for Boris, because at 10.30 a.m. we'll get the Supreme Court uh, ruling as to whether his prorogation, his, his uh, suspending of Parliament was legal or not. Uh, so they're going to make this ruling at 10.30 a.m., so keep your ear to the ground. Um, the speculate, I mean, obviously your pro-Remainers, they're saying, well, Boris is going to obviously have to resign, you know, if he's basically lied and misled the Queen into uh, suspending Parliament. It, it's unforgivable, and he's going to have to step down and resign. Um, Boris isn't going to resign. Uh, there's no way. Okay, so don't... Anybody hoping for that, um, I think, are not thinking rationally. Um, so what's going to happen? Well, Boris will have to be forced into reconvening Parliament. And, you know, what will happen then? Well, I mean, we're, we're almost into October anyway, as it is. But you could argue it might give more time to the um, pro-Remainers to kind of work behind the scenes and on the back benches to further disrupt um, Boris's... Um, sort of plan, if it is his plan, uh, to leave the EU with no deal. So we'll see. But I, I, honestly, I don't think in the grand scheme of things it will actually change much. I mean, from a market reaction point of view, I mean, maybe let's talk about that. And I'll bring cable into the mix here. We've had some dollar strength um, really from the kind of middle of last week in the end. Um, and we had some dollar strength really because, well, you, I guess you would say that that FOMC meeting last week um, showed that the FOMC had divided and that it wasn't a unanimous decision to cut rates again and that therefore kind of introduces the idea that maybe you know the chances of more rate cuts let's say a December cut uh, the chances might have reduced and so a little bit of dollar strength um, yesterday we had a move lower for cable more I'd say more than anything in sympathy with 
Um, the euro dollar move to the downside, so a bit of a correlated move off the back of those eurozone PMI figures that were disappointing. And then it's been very flat and very sideways, and we're just waiting here. You know, what's the Supreme Court going to say? What's Boris going to say? Um, in terms of the initial reaction, it's a tricky one. I mean, I'd say probably more than anything, you'll probably get sterling on the upside um, if the Supreme Court votes that the prorogation was illegal. I actually don't think it will be a massive event from a market point of view. But yeah, probably some upside just because, you, you know, the simple argument should be in the 125 handles a good target. That was key support on Friday. We broke it yesterday. And I'd be looking there for, the, for a target on the upside, which isn't very far away. I mean, it's only 30 pips from where we are now. But perhaps a break up back above 125. And this is because you could argue if it's illegal, if Parliament have to reconvene, then Boris's ability to take the UK out of the EU with no deal is reduced potentially um, but I don't see big fireworks off the back of this announcement and anyway they might say that it is legal in which case fine we, we carry on um, and we carry on and what Boris is doing he's timing a speech today from New York um, to try and put some more headlines on the spectrum um, to try and uh, you know distract attention away from the Supreme Court ruling and what he's going to say is actually a little bit controversial from the Europeans point of view because he's going to start to say that he he thinks that you know we should he, he's going to be very bullish about Brexit and he's going to say right we should take full advantage of our new freedoms and he's going to talk about how um, we should change policy in order to diverge away from the EU to form a competitive advantage and how we should uh, cut corporation tax, for example, to try and attract in foreign investment. Um, we should relax regulation in certain areas, making, you know, what he wants to do is make it very attractive for US and Canadian businesses and students and, um, you know, technically high skilled individuals to come to the UK uh, to enjoy the benefits. Now, obviously, that's very bullish for the UK, right? But um, Europe aren't going to like that. I mean, Theresa May's deal, uh, part of that was a commitment to make sure that the UK stays aligned with the EU in, in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, obviously, the last thing the EU want is Brexit, is, is the UK leaving, and then the UK you know, diverging away from Europe, um, forming a, a significant... Um, sort of economic competitor right on Europe's doorstep. That's the last thing they want. So if Boris, if he is going to do what he says, then the chances of a deal before the 31st of October reduce. Um, also, the chances of a trade agreement being agreed after Brexit, I, I'd say again, become way more difficult. So whilst Boris might be bullish and making all the right noises and it will definitely... Um, you know, the nationalists will love it. Um, the Brexiteers will be cheering in the streets. But actually, I think it will make the uh, ability for us to do a deal with the EU a lot more difficult. So um, we'll see. So borrow, you know, expect plenty of, plenty of Brexit chat, certainly this morning, 10.30 a.m., key moment. Um, the Supreme Court rules. And then Boris is going to be making some speeches out of New York. Okay. All right, what else? Um, so Trump, let's talk about Trump. He's Trump's in in trouble, or is he? Um, there's so many times Trump has... The impeachment risk, I don't know how many impeachment risks we've had since he took office, but it's definitely in record territory for a US president. So this is a new story, you'll probably have read about it already, but the Democrats have been saying that Trump has been using his office um, to try and influence the election next year. And what he's done is he's been apparently According to the Democrats, remember, um, and of course they're going to say this. Um, apparently, he's been withholding 400 billion, sorry, 400 million dollars of military aid to the Ukraine, and he's been withholding it because he wants the Ukrainian president to investigate into something that happened a few years back when Joe Biden was vice president under Obama. Apparently, according to Trump, Joe Biden forced the Ukrainians into firing a prosecutor who was looking into the business dealings of a certain company in Ukraine who Joe Biden's son, uh, who named, whose name is Hunter Biden, happened to be on the board. 
So Hunter Biden has got business dealings in the Ukraine. One of his businesses was under investigation. Apparently, Joe Biden forced the Ukrainians into firing the prosecutor. Um, now Trump's um, withholding aid in order to force the Ukrainians into investigating this. And obviously, from Trump's point of view, he wants all of this to come out into the open because Joe Biden happens to be one of his key challengers for the election in 2020. Um, so the election uh, fighting has definitely begun. And unfortunately, the election's not for another 14 months. So um, just strap yourselves in. It's going to be an ugly fight. It always is when Trump's uh, one of the uh, competitors. So um, the point here is that Nancy Pelosi, who's the kind of head of the Democrats, if you like, um, she's always been of the opinion that, look, let's not go down the road of trying to impeach Trump because it will just fire up his nationalist supporters and it will probably backfire. But actually, even she's now um, pushing towards the idea that this particular situation has gone beyond any reasonable behavior and that maybe we should be moving towards some kind of impeachment scenario. So look, this is a story that's flared up. You know what? Um, from experience, uh, if we just look at markets, and I said to you earlier, markets that don't, don't care. They really don't care. We've seen these things happen, I don't know how many times. And yes, it's going to be all over the headlines for sure. But unless Trump actually gets impeached, and I don't think that's even possible because the Republicans control the House. They control the, the Senate. And so I actually don't think even if the Democrats want it, it's not going to be possible. So really, I think this is just headline noise. It's just part and parcel of this election campaign that's now up and running in earnest. So I don't think markets really care. So the s and is chopping around the 3,000 handle. What the markets do care about is, sorry, I wasn't showing you my chart there. Here's the S&P, very sideways, actually, when you're looking at it, back over the last week or so. Uh, consolidation now. Uh, what they do care about is much more you know, things related to the US-China trade war. And we've had some positive news on that overnight. This is why the s and just popped up through this 3,000 handle. Um, the news being that we had some kind of lower level talks on this trade agreement last week, which was uh, now it's been announced is ahead of what are then more top level talks, which are going to take place in Washington next week. OK, so we have another round of negotiations happening next week. Of course, just the fact that there are some negotiations is a positive. But you know how this goes. Um, I don't know how many negotiation rounds they've had now. I mean, I literally don't know, 10, 20, 30. And of course, all of them have in the end. It's, it's the kind of Groundhog Day um, where it kind of breaks down. Any hint of it breaking down, Trump starts getting aggressive on Twitter and then ramps up some uh, ag aggressive threats on tariffs and then goes ahead and increases tariffs. And then the Chinese go, all right, fine, let's start negotiating again. And, and the, the Groundhog Day rebegins. So at the moment, again, markets have become desensitized to this. And uh, the S&P at the moment is just chopping around 3,000. Now, where is the S&P going to go? Let's look at the daily chart, because what's the next big thing? Because we're right up here. We're right up here at all-time highs. That high in July is the all-time top. Okay, we're right up at the top. And haven't we got all these risks, you know, the trade war risk? Isn't Europe in recession and all the rest of it? Well, central banks have turned very dovish, and that's certainly been the catalyst to take the S&P back to the top. Um, but we've got quarter three ending, so we're going to have quarter three earnings season. Um, and that'll get going in October, and that'll be an important update to see just how corporate America um, is faring. Um, but, you know, it's about the Fed. Are the Fed going to cut in December? And uh, the chart, I mean, looking at the meeting from last week, it's maybe not. And if the Fed don't cut, then this market is not going to stay at the all time highs. The only reason it's up here is because the Fed is cutting. If the Fed stopped cutting, the market will not be up here. And we're way more worried about the risks such as the U.S. trade war risk with China. OK, so I'd say it's mostly about the Federal Reserve where this market goes over the next three months. Um, all right. Just finally, just to cover off, I think I've mentioned everything I want to talk about. The other thing was uh, the other thing, I guess, to finish on. Let's have a look at the data calendar for today. Um, so let me just change up my screenshot here and 
have a little look and the key moment will be in uh, 15 minutes time where we're going to get more German data so the German iPhone number um, the business climate the the so the IFO expectations component is the most important we're expecting 91.8 which would be a slight increase on last month's 91.3 I am going to very quickly show you the chart for this um, because it is a really important um, German number and we're nervous about it given the fact that um, actually I'm not sure do the do trading economics cover this Chart. Actually, I've got a feeling they don't. All right, I'm not going to show you the chart. Um, but it's definitely an important number, and we're nervous it's going to be more bad news given what happened yesterday with the PMI reading. So keep your ear to the ground for that. 9 a.m., most important data of the whole day. Um, UK Supreme Court ruling at 10.30. Um, world leaders arriving at the UN. That's going to be at 1 o'clock. So when they're arriving, this is when the press shoves some microphones in front of their faces, and you can get some throwaway comments that might be important. So certainly any of the key Brexit players, certainly Donald Trump, the Ukrainian president, you know, what are they going to say about this latest scandal, um, all the rest of it. This afternoon, most interesting data out of the US is consumer confidence. Um, this will be at three o'clock and we're expecting a slight drop from last month's figure. Um, and then in terms of speakers, really busy week for monetary policy speak so you can see here we've got some ECB guys and Carney's talking at 4.15 um, at the World Economic Forum. Um, we want to see, you know, is, is, is the Bank of England going to cut rates in quarter four? Um, so that's the lineup for the session. That's it for the briefing, guys. Uh, enjoy your trading days. Thanks very much.